Welcome to this episode of the AEC Engineering and Technology Podcast, a podcast dedicated to helping engineering professionals find technology that fits their needs. Today, I'll be speaking with John Delia Jr., a distinguished real estate entrepreneur and construction innovator. John's expertise spans from traditional real estate development to cutting-edge sustainable practices, and in this episode, he'll be speaking about technology's role in shaping urban development, discussing innovative construction methods, and providing some great advice for engineers interested in transitioning into the real estate sector. And with that, let's jump into today's episode. John, welcome to the show. Great to have you on. Howdy, Nick. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Absolutely. And this is this is going to be a great episode to the audience because John's a very unique guy and in his kind of position in, in the, the AEC and real estate world has gotten into some some very interesting and unique things. So we'll just get get right into it. John, can you tell the audience a little bit more about yourself and what motivated you to uh, pursue a career in real estate and construction? Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, so I guess I'd have to start with my origin story. Uh, I'm originally a New Yorker before I migrated to the Midwest I had the privilege of being a part of a family who was in the real estate development business. So, you know, it turns out my grandfather was a carpenter and my dad ended up becoming a home builder in New York. And although I was present, I would like to say I was unconscious initially. So as a young child, being under the boardroom table at an office is kind of like, I'm hungry. I want to go home. What are we doing? Um, Being on job sites, I don't think as a child, I was conscious enough to put together what's going on here. Um, but as I grew up and as I matured, obviously through um, high school, et cetera, I started to realize, oh, wow, what a what a privilege that my family is able to develop buildings, properties, neighborhoods, et cetera. I'd love to learn more about this. Um, I will say, you know, inequity initially was probably the main motivation. When I looked at certain neighborhoods, I thought about the game Monopoly. And, you know, I remember my dad telling me someone owns all these buildings in all these neighborhoods, whether it's a good or a bad neighborhood. And I started to piece together that if I became a real estate developer, I might be able to influence who lives in what neighborhoods, what type of product gets to be built. And ultimately, that was really interesting to me. And as I learned more about the built environment, decided to you know craft my education around learning about it. Beautiful. And and in that context, right, John, so you talked a little bit about right, planning neighborhoods, cities, right? touched on like the inequality piece as to kind of how you came to be where you're at. So with all that background and like city and regional planning, like how do you see technology, particularly AI shaping the future of urban development and real estate? That's a, that's a great question. So the, the touching on the background in city planning, you know, some of the original planners, um, Burnham in Chicago, Jane Jacobs will give her credit. Uh, Robert Moses will give him credit. Some of these planners we're not actually formally trained planners, but decided that, hey, we're going to influence the built environment and we're going to participate. And a lot of the old world work of AEC was done physically by hand in offices with large scale drafting tables and paper and pencil, et cetera, et cetera. So I think right now we're at, the, in my opinion, one of the most unique opportunities because this merger of technology is allowing us not only to be more productive and efficient, but in terms of the level of ideation and creation, I think it's going to push us forward a lot quicker than we've ever seen before. Now, that's going to come with a lot of learning and transition, but I view it as a way that you can prototype, you can ideate, and you could hopefully move projects along further and faster. Absolutely. And I guess, like, are there any applications or technologies in particular that you find promising or impactful? And like, what have you kind of seen in the field? Yeah. No. So I think that's an awesome question. And there's um, there's a couple of pieces of technology that I've been following slash working with. I'll probably talk about two briefly. So on one end is the latest that I've discovered. I'd like to think I'm a nerd and I find myself down the rabbit hole a lot. So there's been this recent Silicon Valley startup. It's called Welcome Home. And they're using AI to rapidly prototype the rendering, the floor plan, and the um, the visualization of residential homes. So from site selection to then looking at the feasibility, changing materiality, colors, et cetera, their AI technology allows you to rapidly prototype and test that out in real time, which I don't see a lot of the national builders doing whatsoever. So to see that capacity, even though it's heavy software, heavy investment, I'm like, wow, once this becomes more scalable, it's going to be very impactful. Another piece of technology I really like is called, I'll butcher the name, but I'll just spell it, OPO Plan. 
And it essentially, myself as a developer, when I'm looking for a particular lot or piece of property, land that I want to buy, obviously we have the constraints of zoning. What are the setbacks? What's the floor area ratio? What can we actually build on that piece of property? Well, OPO plan allows you to utilize the technology to plug into the zoning code. And it actually allows you to see what the building footprint will look like on that particular plant. I mean, excuse me, on that particular site. So from a rapid ideation and feasibility standpoint, that saves a lot of time and energy before I'd go to a civil engineer or a surveyor to ask for a specific plot plan or a survey, et cetera. So once again, allows for rapid prototyping. And a last piece of technology I'll share that I think is really promising because I believe it's powered by AI, et cetera, and it's specifically for rapid iteration, is in terms of, once again, better feasibility, there's a company out of, I believe they're in Austin, Texas, called TestFit. And once again, typically you would go to an architecture firm or an engineering firm, tell them the unit makeup, the mix of type of building you're trying to build, and they would then give you conceptual designs of a building, the footprint, the floors, et cetera. Well, TestFit allows you to input certain data points, and it'll literally build a building with different unit makeups and size makeups and the parking requirements, et cetera. So once again, to move that rapid prototyping along quicker and for less cost, I think is going to allow more projects to be ideated and thought through quicker. So I think AI is just here to serve us. It's not going to replace us, but I think it's definitely here to serve us. John, couldn't agree more. And I think it's all about how you use it. And, and a couple of notes on kind of John's description of what he's seeing in the market. So episode 11 of this podcast, we actually had Nat McDonald with TestFit on explaining more of kind of like what TestFit does. Yes, from like the architect or developer standpoint, but how it can also help civil engineers. Um, we had an episode with Bentley Systems, right? It's all about computational and generative design. And John, you might, you know, find interesting, right? The kind of automation and base layout planning of developments and, and neighborhoods under right, a certain tract for like, um, let's say a home builder, right? But the point being with all of these technologies, like John said, to iterate faster, get more ideas on paper, and then before getting a design professional involved, being able to say, hey, like, is this going to fit whatever plans you might have had? Um financially or how much land you're working with, et cetera, is kind of kind of what I'm getting out of what you're what you're saying, John. Yeah, totally in agreement. Happy to hear you had the guys that test fit on. And um yeah, that's exactly what we're discussing here. So again, episode eleven for anyone that's interested in finding out more about test fit. But in terms of, you know, let's keep on the the topic of technology, but now we're gonna move from software to kick it back to the real world, right? So okay. for everyone, um that doesn't know. So John's the co-founder of the housing joint venture and the owner of Light Steel Industries, right? John's, of course, deeply involved in sustainable building practices. So John, like, how do you involve um, technology into your construction processes to enhance sustainability and efficiency? And I'm really curious to hear, hear more about Light, Light Street Industries. Oh, thanks, Nick. Uh, first and foremost, I'd say it's definitely a balance. I think that construction and development is... As much as it's very progressive, I think it's very still old world. So it's very much analog, paper driven, paper oriented. As much as we want to apply all the technology and software, I think that's going to be slow to adopt. So for us, I think that we're very much research and development driven. We try to reevaluate our day to day activities, our decision making, our processes continuously. Um, we're always looking for room for improvement and how to automate what we're doing in terms of scalability and best practices. I think for us, the goal is, is to become a master builder is how I'd like to describe ourselves. But prior to doing that, we have to start with just the everyday old world technologies. You did mention light street. So we'll touch on how we're moving towards steel and steel construction. But even so, we've had to master lumber and wood framing. And thinking about the inefficiencies, thinking about the supply chain, thinking about the day-to-day -day activities with our on-site guys and how they implement those technologies, and then thinking how can we then evolve and implement the new technology. So it's a constant evolutionary process. I think it has to move slowly. And you also have to be mindful of the cost of execution. And once you're onboarded on particular softwares or platforms, what are those implications long-term? Is your data 
locked in and are you stored or is it nimble and modular where you can evolve as the technology evolves? Great points. And I think that's actually been one of the common themes we've we've seen on the show, right? One, data, privacy, and security and access. And then like, will this work for your company today, but will it also work down the line um, as things change for both you and any software vendor that you're working with? Definitely. So I actually didn't know this, but in, until recently, but John is also an author, right? So you have is it is it just your single book or do you have have more than one? You know what? I have um, two books now under my hat. The first one was in 2017, Life, Liberty, and Property. It was my first book, A Guide to Successful Real Estate Investment. And then more recently, we released a um, a fiction book because sometimes people don't want the Blaine in your face nonfiction. They want a little storytelling and marketing. So we released a, a fiction story about a futuristic future where home building will be revolutionized with this new roll form steel technology. And that's kind of bringing the market towards where we're going with residential steel framing, which is only 1% of the market share right now nationally. So when you introduce, it's not a new technology, but conceptually it's a new idea to the mass market. You have to figure out a way to dress it up and make it look pretty before people pay attention to it. Absolutely. And, and, you know, and, I out of curiosity, right? Because for what I would assume would be right, the average the average home buyer, right? They're probably more concerned with certain other aspects of the process or the finished product, right, than what frames the structure. So I think you're 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 correct there. I think for the most part, construction and home building, although we might believe it, it's not a consumer driven industry. Typically the developers get to pick the method, the location, the area, and the technology. Uh, the homeowner might make those customizations from an aesthetic standpoint, what facade, what stone, what flooring, the layout. But is Mr. and Mrs. Homebuyer going to say, hey, I want this particular framing system or this particular construction method? Not quite. However, I believe it's our duty as industry professionals to push the industry towards superior products, superior performance and innovation. So when we look at kind of where the evolution of the industry has been, Lumber and labor were always abundant and easily accessible. Um, you know, as the market has evolved, as COVID interrupted our supply chains, and as the industry is aging out with the average age being mid 40s, early 50s, we have to really rethink how are we going to meet the supply demand issues and those constraints. So for us, we recognize that this technology had been available, although it wasn't massively adopted in particular for residential. So once again, our duty is to then help educate the consumer on why you should use the superior product and how it's beneficial in the long term. Which is awesome because like you said, right, it's not really a consumer driven market, but you're taking it upon yourself to be able to say, hey, like there is a better way. And, you know, perhaps that results in multiple positives to the consumer. I think everybody's thinking towards like lower costs and faster times to delivery, which my understanding, understanding, right, is is cold form is a good candidate for both of those. Exactly. I think cold form is the best candidate. I, I'd liken it to the iPhone. When the iPhone was introduced, you know, my iPhone, I remember, you know, I was young, I was getting out of high school, and I told my dad, oh, my God, you need this phone. This is incredible. You can do everything from it. He's like, what are you talking about? I don't need that. And let's say a decade later, whatever many years later, his smartphone is glued to his hand. Couldn't think about living without it. So I think once again, early on, when you talk about innovation and technology, I don't think it's technology and innovation for innovation's sake, unless you have that luxury. Um, but when you look at solving real world problems, being pragmatic about it, I think that the solutions do exist, but you also have to lead with confidence, understanding you've done the research, you've done the work, and then implement it. So what we believe is, is rather than selling the dog food to the market first and foremost, we're making our own dog food. And as home builders and developers, rather than going straight to a manufacturing play, we've nested the manufacturing in our construction and building operation. And we're building our own infill homes. We're building our own subdivisions and then utilizing the marketing and the branding to remove obscurity to then have that questioning of, huh, I've never seen this before. Uh huh. Why did they do it this way? And then at that point, we could help educate that end consumer. Excellent. And this is uh... a Another interesting fact that I've learned about John recently, right? So John's got got quite the interesting nickname, the construction cowboy for your, <laughs> for some of your innovative practices, right? I, I think I, I love it. I think it's it's awesome. 
So can you elaborate on how you're pushing the boundaries of conventional construction methods through technology? And we've kind of touched on little pieces of it, of both, but from the software side and then kind of the real world implementation, materials, methods, et cetera. Yes. So, you know, when I got into the industry, I'll tell you, I started off with urban core inner city buildings. You know, I was in the Midwest slash Rust Belt. So you're talking 1920s vintage buildings that typically were 100 years old. So initially, when I was learning construction, I was in the repair, restore, remodel business. And if you could save it, save it. If you could restore it, restore it. And that was the market. But I soon learned that that market was 100% custom. So from a scalability standpoint, it wasn't really scalable. From an implementation standpoint, once you gain enough experience, you realize once I open these walls, there will be uncertain and unknown factors that any experienced person will tell you will exist. So, you know, as you look for scalability, as you look for better margins, as you look for easier implementation and non-custom work, you begin to seek out new methods and new resources. Now, you know, we've hired a lot of older um, veterans in the industry to work with us. I look at myself still as an apprentice. And I remember one of our older gentlemen who worked for a, a large architecture firm in the West Coast, he had mentioned, John, if you're going to do things, you can't be so antiquated, man. You got to be innovative. And I remember Paul telling me this. I'm like, what are you talking about? Check out steel, man. I'm like, what are you talking about? I've never seen this. And I discovered um, steel framing. So I went back to my actually building and kip carpentry textbook. And little did you know, there was a whole chapter on it in terms of the residential context for framing. Then I looked at the International Building Code and realized, oh my God, this is a well-established code and there's no reinventing the wheel. It's documented. It's there. It's just not being implemented at scale in terms of residential. So once again, as I started to move away from some of the challenges of 100-year-old buildings, I realized that the new construction business was probably right to enter, and that was the new blue ocean for us. So as we entered that industry, we started studying framing technologies, building construction methods, and we recognized that construction typically has been skill labor led. Although the AEC professional might design and um, promote the project, the actual implementers, the construction skilled labor and workforce, they're responsible for that custom fabrication. And we realized that we wanted to move from skill labor led to design led and let the people in the office make more of the decisions and get more fine tuned. Another thing we recognize is that in traditional lumber, you have 20 to 30% waste in terms of materials. And with BIM building information technology and software driven technology, we can be within a 1% precision. So for me, after doing the research, after learning, after visiting factories, after seeing it implemented, I thought it was a no-brainer to say, hey, let's start transitioning our business to where the future will be. And even though it was such a low percentage, we realized that when you can feed your CAD plans to a software system and it can literally punch out all the service holes, dimples, et cetera, it's in within 1% precision and it follows the plan. And then those plans can be fabricated, panelized, and erected off-site and brought to site. I thought to myself, wow, you can build a house in three days. I, this is incredible. So, you know, I think it's once again, out of necessity, we discovered the technology. And then more so after learning that the technology has been around since the era of Henry Ford, it gave us that confidence to say, we're not really inventing something new. Which when you think about it, compared to traditional approaches, John is amazing. The fact that you can go into some sort of building, building information modeling software and, and you can tell me, hey. These, this is down to the screw, right? Where, like, where my hole should be punched and, you know, part tracking or right, shipping the site and, and everything that comes with it compared to, right, the conventional home building process. So plans, right, and all of the, the waste factors and everything that goes down the line. And, I mean, have you talked to, like, veterans of the industry kind of shared your vision? I'm sure you have. But, like, what's been, like, the consensus or the feedback on, on these ideas? You know, so that's a great question. I think that getting to scale is probably where we're going. I've talked to a lot of industry um, veterans. I think that there's probably two broad buckets we'll talk about, and I'm sure there's more, but I'll just make it binary. On one end, you have the business as usual. Here's the way things have always been done. Why innovate? There's no reason. It's not broken. Don't fix it. And on the other end, you have people who are saying, look, 
the technology exists, the innovation is there. If we better educate our our stakeholders, we can better implement and execute projects. So I think for the most part, even when we use the term BIM, a large percent of the industry is not using BIM. So I, I also believe that going to school for city planning slash architecture gives you this luxury of understanding the broad or the depth of the ecosystem or the ocean, I should say, but it's not necessarily implemented across the industry. So, you know, I think from an adoption standpoint, it's going to take time. But at the same time, I think that, like you mentioned, with the down to the screw. So for us, when you look at standardization and scalability, I mentioned scalability earlier and, and the contrast to custom 100-year-old buildings. When we're looking at all the various product SKUs and components that make up a house, with the ability of having software and essentially moving towards what we're calling industrialized construction and manufacturing, we're going to be able to quantify the cost of goods of a construction build from day one. We'll know what all the component parts cost. The two various factors I like to leave out are margin and labor or margin labor overhead. But when you're able to quantify upfront the land costs, the engineering costs, and the actual raw materials, that gets you further along in that process than the unpredictability of the custom fabrication that we just, that we talked about on site. So it gives me more confidence to say that as we execute projects, you know, we'll be able to be on type, on time, and on budget. Beautiful. And you know, my next question kind of leads into for pretty much what this is all about, right? And you touched on it at the beginning of the interview, right? So building communities, right? People to have home, people in, in your case, right, is more of a is a residential developer, right? People to have homes and people to have a place to to thrive and, and be a part of a community. So how do you envision technology and, and AI like evolving and creating more of these inclusive and sustainable communities in the future? That's a great question. So I think for now, what technology and AI will not replace is wisdom, empathy, and um, just the physical world experience of interacting with people. I think that when I look at a couple major trends of, let's say, sustainability, weather severity, the lack of a workforce and skilled trades, I think we're going to have a lot of constraints and challenges that will lead to increased costs if we don't start to meet the demand. So I think that technology and AI can help actually solve these problems and bring down the cost. And I think they should be tools to be leveraged. You know, I think that they're tools to help aid us in solving the problem. I think that people deserve quality housing, resilient housing. A hurricane shouldn't come and blow away your house and a forest fire shouldn't come and burn down your house. You know, so I think that when we look at the building methods, we have to choose the most sustainable, cost-effective approaches to development. And, you know, that comes with knowledge, education, and what I like to say, experience and exposure. Absolutely. And, you know, you got me, John, you got me thinking with, with one of your examples, right? How everybody kind of deserves a home that does the multitude of things that you described. And one of our previous episodes, more in the commercial sector, but um, firm Thorne Tomasetti um, and their CTO, Rob Otani, I know are using artificial intelligence to essentially speed up um, their design process, right? So instead of doing a lot of manual um, engineering work up front, right, they're using past projects, um, computational and generative design, right, to just say, hey, here's our 30% set, right? We know based on all these past projects and, you know, there's, of course, hand calculations and running engineering checks in the background. Of course. But the point is the time to delivery is just compressing, Right. And it's a great use case because you can have your engineers doing higher value added tasks. And I'm sure you could make some um, comparisons to kind of the, the industry, the, the part of the industry that you're in. Yeah, Nick, and I think what we're alluding to, I'll just describe as unleashing human potential. You know, it's allowing us people to focus on higher value contributions instead of the minutia of busy work. You know, because a lot of this pro product has been rinsed and repeated in multiple markets. But, you know, to unleash our potential and let us solve more complex problems, I think that's the right direction for the industry. Absolutely. And and it's just and, and to this point, it's been difficult to capture all of that knowledge because it's not like it's in some central repository. We know how fragmented, right, the industry is. And 
how many different players are involved and just even a, a relatively simple building coming together, right? So the the future is bright. It just uh, it's going to depend what what we as people make of it, right? That's exactly it. What do they say? The future is here. It's just not evenly distributed. <laughs> and you know, being you know having the pleasure to to host this podcast and talk to a lot of great people has made me aware because aware of that because there are some firms that are doing some very unique and interesting things, and others are not even aware that such a thing is possible, right? So we see it all the time and it's, it, 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 but it, either way, it's, it's an exciting time to be in the industry. Yeah, I'll definitely agree with you. We're one of the first in our county to implement cold form steel for residential application. So working with the chief building officials, chief inspectors was a privilege because, you know, from a commercial construction standpoint, it's standard business as usual. But from a residential, I know that when the local neighbors view outside their window, like, what is this building in my neighborhood? What is this skeleton? That's the kind of level of curiosity and excitement that we want to help create. And I think that's where the brightness of the future comes in. I like to look at imagine a world where home building and construction is consumer driven and consumers have demands and those demands are being met and the companies have to innovate. And in a spirit of excellence, we keep evolving to deliver the best quality products to the market. Absolutely. So, John, again, it has been a pleasure having you on, um, particularly because I think as we've explored today, right, your viewpoints are definitely from a different perspective and are, are super valuable to, you know, other AEC professionals because it's not always something we get that type of exposure to. I just wanted to ask, like, any final pieces of advice you have for engineers interested in transitioning into the real estate and construction sectors? And more like, because we're all involved in one way or another, but perhaps away from engineering and more into um, real estate construction? You know, Nick, I think that's a great question. First and foremost, I'd say stay curious. You know, it's, I like to believe that curiosity and knowledge are the best thing you could do. So learning with intention, figuring out where the gaps in your knowledge are, um, staying curious is probably the first priority. And then next, start small and don't be afraid to start small. I think that Imagine it as a, we call it a charrette in city planning or a case study. So I think that even if you don't own a piece of property, you could easily pick a vacant piece of land and go through the motions of putting a project together, looking at the feasibility, comparing and contrasting different building methods, getting insight from other AEC professionals who could provide feedback and challenge your assumptions. So before you're ready to get in the game, I'd say you have to start practicing and going through those repetitions. And the last piece of advice is similar to how we connected. Get active on social media platforms that you find will be valuable, such as LinkedIn for the most part. And, you know, there's for us, without me having to fly around the country, I've been able to meet so many AEC professionals who have just, you know, expanded my perspective via the power of the Internet. So I think, you know, we have the technology available. We have to use it intentionally. Could not agree more. And John, if the audience wants to reach out to you to find out more about, you know, what you're doing on the development side, right? Light Street or anything else you're working on. What's the best way for them to reach you? I think the best platform for me is on LinkedIn. So John Delia Jr. on LinkedIn. Uh, feel free to shoot me a connection, shoot me a message. And, you know, we could definitely continue the dialogue from there. Beautiful. So for anyone who's listening and doesn't have a pen handy, um, all of the info we've talked about today um, will be in the show notes, including the link to John's LinkedIn profile. But again, John, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Awesome. Thanks, Nick, for the platform and the opportunity to participate. Thank you. Yes, sir. And we will we'll catch you next time. Please remember, you can find the show notes for this episode at aectechpodcast.com. There, you will find a summary of key points discussed in today's episode, as well as links to any of the resources, websites, or books mentioned during this episode. Until next time, I wish you the best in all of your engineering and technology endeavors. Thank you.